I hate feeling stuck. When is the last time you felt stuck? The other day, I was in the drive-thru feeling a little hungry, wanting to order a taco. When I started wondering, is the lady in front of me ordering for the school district? <laughs> or for the city? I couldn't go backwards. I couldn't go forward. I was going to be late. And all I wanted was a taco. We spend a lot of our lives feeling stuck. We're stuck in traffic, stuck in a drive-thru, stuck in a job, a relationship. We spend a lot of our lives, let's just say it, stuck. Recently, I was visiting some friends, and it was time for me to go. So I stood up, I pushed the door open, and the door immediately slammed in my face. The man on the other side said, you are not going anywhere. I listened as he, the correctional officer said, we are in institutional lockdown and movement is frozen. Immediately, my mind went back to a place I did not want to be. And that was stuck in prison, in an eight by eight cell, where something was created in me that did not leave when I was set free. You see, it was there when I was looking for a job and was turned down. It was there when I was looking for housing and was rejected. It was there when my children looked at me. And it was there when I had to face myself day to day. I had a new prison, and that prison was shame. Adam shared some numbers. I'll share a little more. Oklahoma incarcerates more women per capita than anywhere in the world. And do you know the leading charge is possession of drugs. The national average is about 34 women per month. Oklahoma incarcerates about 68 women per month. Have you heard how we leave 28,000 children behind with an incarcerated parent? There was a task force that was uh, created to do a study of that number. And what they suggested was seven out of 10 of those children will follow in their parents' footsteps without an intervention. See, we're creating a generational cycle of incarceration and shame. Behind these statistics, there are stories. And I'm gonna share a couple of stories with you today. Amber, Amber was in her early 30s. Single, head of household, mother of three. Amber was stuck in addiction. And she got arrested and she was given a program. She messed up, like we all mess up sometimes. Amber's mess up was called a relapse. Do you think her punishment was a slap on the hand? A second chance in the program? Or a life sentence? If you guessed life sentence, you guessed correctly. Can I tell you that a life sentence takes the life out of children? When I heard Amber's story, I knew I had to be her voice. I had to tell it. 
And I told it everywhere I went. And sometimes people got tired of hearing it. But I told it again and again and again for a little over two years, everywhere I went. And then one day, someone said, I can help you. And when they got involved, the Friday before Christmas Eve, Amber walked out of prison and was restored to her three children. She left the state of Oklahoma. She's employed and she's doing good. Yeah. Why did I care? Why was Amber's story and her children, why was that my problem? Because somebody cared for me and my children. See, I'm Rhonda Bear, also known as the Department of Corrections number 377-488. I also was stuck in addiction. I was a daughter, I was a sister, and I had three amazing children who called me mom. I battled drug addiction from the time I was 12 years old till I was 37. When I was being sentenced to prison, my little girl was about eight years old. She's with me today. She's, yes. Mm -hmm. But she looked at me that day and she said, Mom, I can't even cry because I've cried so many times. Mom, please don't leave me. Please don't leave me, Mom. The pleas of my children and their tears couldn't even pull me out of that addiction I was stuck in. I got a 10-year sentence to prison. And while I was in prison, I met this young lady. She was young, petite, early 30s, a mother. Her baby was about four months old. And I wondered, why is someone like you coming into a maximum security prison? But she said she felt called. She became my mentor, and she mentored me in prison. When I got to the gate, she introduced me to her friends, and they all became my mentors. These first two rows, these are my mentors. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes. They were determined to walk with me. And sometimes it was really hard. It was hard on them, and it was hard on me. See, they taught me about a word I'd never heard of before, and that was called accountability. And at first, I did not like it. <laughs> but these people were determined to see me succeed. One time, Eileen said to me, I remember the letters that you wrote me from prison. How much? You missed your children and how badly you wanted to be a mom to them. And I was not going to let you fail. Can I tell you today, because of their determination in my life, I stand before you. I'm still Rhonda Bear, still known as 377488 because it does not fall off of you. But I'm educated. I'm a social worker. I'm a business owner. I'm a nonprofit founder. I am a good mom. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. 
And I am a really, really, really good grandmother. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. They made a difference. Advocates make a difference. They show up. They care. They're determined to help someone not to fail. It's hard work. It takes dedication and it takes commitment. We know everybody's not called to go into the prisons. But we believe that the opportunity to advocate or mentor is all around us. When you have a state that incarcerates more women and more men than anywhere in the world, I'll tell you what, we have children without fathers and we have children without mothers. Our foster system is overflowing. We need mentors. The child at the baseball field that maybe plays with your kid that doesn't have a dad or a mom. The lonely person that sits in the cafeteria by themselves day after day at your job. The homeless shelters are overflowing. The need to advocate and care is all around us. Imagine this, the world, a better place. And we get to be part of the solution. We get to see people in addiction, in prison, in shame, set free. We get to change generations. My children will not walk the walk I walked. My grandchildren will not walk that walk. Generations are changed because someone invested in our lives. Advocacy changes generations. So I ask you today, why not? Thank you.